I've often quoted as saying I would rather be governed by the first 2,000 people in the Boston Telephone Directory than by the 2,000 people on the faculty of Harvard University. In this present crisis, government is not the solution to our problem. Government is the problem. They share our beliefs, our convictions, our hopes, and our dreams. These are the conservatives of the heart. They are our people. Join the best in the movement. It's Conservative Conversations with ISI, educating for liberty since 1953. Welcome back. You're listening to Conservative Conversations with Johnny and Marlo. Today we are joined by Dan McCarthy, editor of Modern Age and vice president for the Collegiate Network. Dan, welcome to our show. Thank you, Marlo. It's a great pleasure to join you and Johnny today. Our listener question of the week comes from Will, who touches on a subject that, Dan, obviously, you're a denizen of, uh, the media. So what kind of wide-scale societal damage is done when the media discredits itself or when fake news is rife? Well, you know, in some ways, the worst damage that the media does is not so much from discrediting itself, but from propagating a view of reality that is inaccurate. And that view of reality is one that is often a kind of reflection of what's going on in the academy. And it is, uh, you know... Often it's uh, built out of unreliable uh, information, and that's where fake news comes in. But sometimes it's a matter of misinterpretation and a matter of mispresentation of uh, things that are individually correct facts, but when they are put together, they can lead to an overall picture that is misleading. And that's the problem we have in America right now, where when we think about economics, when we think about our politics, we think about our foreign policy, all of these uh, subjects of great concern to the American people have been filtered through the lenses provided by the media. And the media tends to have a very distorting lens, one that is shaped by many of the prejudices, especially the progressive prejudices of the academy and of the media's own uh, rather elite class. And this is something that's quite new because the media used to be a rather working class profession. People didn't have trust funds. They got into it. They didn't make a lot of money, but they did it because they really believed in going out there, getting the story, and just the sheer fun of being a journalist, the sheer, uh, you know, sort of um, uh, excitement and adventure of uh, being able to discover what's really happening and then tell people about it. Today, unfortunately, the media has become something of a career and a profession, and it's something where people who are uh, very well-to-do and who have, you know, had their ideas formed by the most elite uh, universities and colleges go into the media and they are presenting a narrative that is already um, preconceived and uh, pre-cooked and which, uh, unfortunately, is one that uh, our political class, our leadership, uh, tends to share. And that has been a rather disastrous uh, worldview uh, over the course of the last uh, 30 years or so Mm -hmm. since the end of the Cold War. If I could jump in here, I think a perfect example of this is the coverage of Glenn Youngkin's victory in Virginia. You saw, instead of blaming themselves for producing a narrative, whether it's about critical theory being taught in the classrooms or antagonism against parents standing up at meetings wanting to be involved in their children's education instead of actually learning the lessons uh, from Yunkin's victory uh, many of in the media especially on the, the mainstream television networks are putting it all back basically saying you know this this essentially proves that all these parents are racist and this is secret dog whistling so it really seems like they're so entrenched in the bubble that even a very clear lesson that they're headed in the wrong direction doesn't seem to sink in. It only reconfirms their priors. Yeah, absolutely. Um, And we'll discuss throughout the podcast kind of Dan's own experiences having, you know, worked as an editor and also a writer himself, especially with how he's going to approach, you know, the Collegiate Network and how uh, Collegiate Network operates on college campuses to try and combat some of uh, the preconceived preconceptions of a lot of these, you know, student journalists who may work for, uh, you know, student dailies and and in, just in that campus atmosphere. For now, we, we we're going to turn for our to our uh, book of the week. Dan, what are you reading right now? Well, I've been uh, reading Harvey Mansfield's classic discussion of Niccolo Machiavelli's The Discourses. The name of that book is uh, New Modes and Orders. I've also been reading a book called Rigged by the journalist Molly Hemingway, which is about uh, the various shenanigans that went into the 2020 election and why Americans are losing faith in the electoral system, in part because of the way in which uh, the media has uh, misrepresented uh, what really goes on and the kinds of concerns that many in the American public have. Marlo, uh, what are you what are you reading this week? Um, so I'm reading Winner Takes All, Steve Wynn, Kurt Kerkorian, Gary Loveman, and the Race to Own Las Vegas by the journalist Christina Binkley. 
I am going to Las Vegas uh, shortly with my, um, my my husband for our pre honeymoon honeymoon to eat at a restaurant I really like. She, you know, it, it's it's a testament to how uh, how much insight journalism can give us because her book certainly illuminated Sin City for me um, as someone who has been there multiple times before. Uh, she kind of gives a, a a glance into the corporate world of what we know as the landscape of Las Vegas. So um, I'm, I'm looking forward to finishing her book just in time for my trip. What about you, uh, Johnny? Yeah, I uh, just picked up a book that was actually published in the late 19. 19- 80s called Communism and Nationalism, Karl Marx versus Friedrich List. Uh, it's by Roman Sporluck, who is a professor at University of Michigan at the time and then Harvard. And he's looking at the historic relationship between Marx and List and uh, how that played out historically uh, in, um, in Eastern Europe in the 19th century. So it's been a, a fascinating read. Uh, yeah, diving into some new subjects for me. Great. Well, thanks so much for the question. Before we continue with our interview, I'd like to thank you for listening to Conservative Conversations. This podcast is a production of the Intercollegiate Studies Institute. Our mission at ISI is to educate for liberty. If you'd like to help us in pursuing that mission, please rate and review this podcast on Apple Podcasts to help us reach more listeners like yourself. So interestingly enough about this episode, all three of us on the show today have a media background in some capacity. And Dan, you're a seasoned denizen of the media yourself between the countless pieces you've produced and uh, I'm sure are also the countless pieces that you've edited. When did you start working in media and what drew you in and led you to managing the Collegiate Network? Well, you know, the answer to uh, both parts of that question is exactly the same thing. I was drawn into the media by running a Collegiate Network uh, publication. So in my undergraduate years at Washington University in St. Louis, I started a collegiate network newspaper. Now, this is an independent conservative uh, college paper uh, with some support, logistical and a little bit of financial support from ISI. Uh, It was called The Washington Witness, and uh, we produced it uh, every month. It was a tabloid newspaper format, and it really gave me uh, experience with every facet of creating a professional level uh, publication. So I was editing, I was writing, I was also uh, occasionally working on layout. Uh, I was managing a team of other editors, writers, and reporters. And uh, it really was a um, a trial by fire in the best sense. It really gave me uh, the, the skills necessary to then go and become a professional journalist. Uh, I joined the American Conservative Magazine as its first new hire in uh, 2003, uh, back during the heyday of controversies like the Iraq War, for example. I joined it as a a staff writer, a reporter, and uh, my skills were so versatile because of my experience with the Collegiate Network that I was able to work as a uh, a literary editor when that position became open at the American Conservative, and then I became eventually the editor-in-chief of the entire publication, uh, the American Conservative. And in fact, uh, you know, my skills, even in uh, business and in financing a publication, came from uh, the experience I had with the Collegiate Network. So it's been a, uh, a logical progression that I've now returned to the Collegiate Network. Uh, I'm a, you know, here at ISI full-time as a vice president for the CN. And uh, we have this wonderful network of independent campus uh, publications, which uh, we help to support and keep alive and to promote and to help get started. And uh, we have them on about 70 campuses right now, and they continue to grow. And we have a terrific staff here at ISI who have uh, been working with these students and uh, helping them deal with controversies. You know, you still have uh, administrations and faculty members who will throw away whole print runs of conservative campus publications simply because they cannot stand to have a debate of ideas. And uh, the Collegiate Network is here to make sure that students have the ability to print independently and make their voices heard without being squashed by political correctness on their campuses. Now, Dan, you know, as a as a former student journalist, what would you say, and I was a student journalist myself, and um, what would you say is the most important skill that a conservative or a, a journalist, rather, um, we, we, we don't want to make it necessarily ideological, but what is the most important skill that a, uh, a budding journalist should pick up? I would say that I think reporting and what's so great about the Collegiate Network is it does offer those deep dives into, uh, you know, into regional papers where you report on the community, on the surrounding community and events that are occurring. And you really get a taste of the that element of, you know, speaking to people and recording and taking inventory of your surroundings in, in the way that a journalist does. But what would you say are, are some of the skills that students should make sure a, that they are picking up on early in their in their careers? 
It's two things. So you're exactly right about reporting. And what I would say is that even though not everyone who goes into the media is going to become a reporter, you'll also have editors, you'll have producers, you'll have people working on any number of other facets of the field. Um, you need to have an appreciation for reporting and what good reporting is going out there, interviewing people, getting the story, looking at source documents, you know, going to events, reporting in person. Um, you can't have this uh, sort of perpetual echo chamber that we have today where there's very little on the ground original reporting and there's just a endless repetition and recycling of takes and of opinions from one side or another. Getting the real story itself, getting the facts by reporting in person is invaluable. The other thing that is uh, essential and I think people really do acquire through the Collegiate Network is a sense of uh, good ethics as a journalist and being able to, even if you have a campus publication that may, you know, it may be libertarian or it may be conservative, it may have a particular ideological focus. Nevertheless, there is a way in which you can be uh, fair to people that you disagree with and you can uh, you know, kind of give an accurate representation of where they're coming from. And I really wish that the media today, the professional media, would have this spirit and this ethic, because clearly uh, you know, they, um, they're often coming from a more left-wing perspective you know, at the Washington Post or wherever else uh, than they realize, and they are sort of um, prejudiced against and inherently um, you know, uh, ill-prepared to understand where conservatives are even coming from. And the point Johnny alluded to uh, just a few minutes ago about what happened in the most recent Virginia gubernatorial election, where many um, progressives and Democrats, I don't think they even understood why the election was going the way that it was and why uh, Glenn Youngkin was uh, getting so much momentum and why uh, Terry McAuliffe's campaign was imploding. And it's precisely because the media didn't really understand that when parents were concerned about critical race theory being taught in schools, for example, they were not being racist. They were not saying that America's flawless and that it never had you know, any kind of racial injustices. But they were rather saying that uh, critical race theory and the derivatives of critical race theory that get thrown into our public schools are really strongly anti-American. They're really strongly quite racist in themselves and being, uh, you know, dep depicting all white people as oppressors. And ordinary Americans, ordinary voters in Virginia were very concerned about that. That turned them against Terry McAuliffe. Uh, but McAuliffe himself and many of his supporters couldn't understand what was happening because they were looking at and reading and, and watching a media that was really only presenting one side of this topic. Dan, on the on the ethics side of things, there's a you know obviously you know students undergo courses in ethics that help determine what is and what isn't published in some but circumstances can blur those lines. Um, can you speak a little bit more in depth? You know, presumably most of the reporters at the Washington Post or New York Times have taken ethics courses, but it doesn't quite seem to translate into reality. So what? What ought a young reporter need to know about ethics and also kind of maybe sort of making this a little more concrete if you were to write a piece that, you know, lays into the facts, but is highly critical of someone, is there a way to go about it? I know I, I heard an old sort of adage that if you're going to stab someone uh, in terms of journalism, you know, never stab them in the back, stab them in the chest, basically, give them a phone call first and let them know that the story is coming their way. So I don't know if you can tackle the ethics piece, but also the very practical. How do you write about people that you don't like or you might be publishing something bad about? That's a great question. And you know, one of the things that I wish the public were more educated about, and this would require that journalists themselves uh, dedicate themselves to talking about this, is the way in which stories are written, the way in which editors assign articles, and uh, what goes into reporting a piece. And the answer, unfortunately, is that many journalists simply take, for example, opposition research that is handed to them by someone for, who has their own agenda, or they take leaks where, you know, the um, impression we're all meant to uh, uh, believe is that when someone leaks something from a government agency, they're doing it out of a, a you know, public spiritedness and just to get a, an important truth out there. When in fact, within all of these different bureaucracies, there are different factions with, which have different goals and, and uh, different uh, special interests, and they will selectively leak whatever information will advance their agenda. And there are certain journalists, and in fact, very, very large numbers of them, who uh, take this leaked information, who take information that is partial and that is, is really part of a, uh, a disinformation campaign or a propaganda campaign being waged by one particular party or one particular faction within a bureaucracy. And they will present this to the public and say, oh, these are, you know, anonymous sources. Um, you know, you're supposed to just trust that our anonymous sources are reliable. The public has no way of verifying any of this. And so the public 
you know, journalists who are unscrupulous can get away with this for a little while. And they have their, uh, their um, anonymous sources that uh, the public's willing to go along with. But then as it comes out that things like, uh, you know, the many allegations made about uh, Donald Trump and Russia, for example, are not only disproved, but turn out to be, uh, you know, disinformation operations concocted by um, political actors, by uh, opposition research firms and by, you know, foreign governments for that matter. Once these things are exposed, then the journalists who are relying on rumors and uh, anonymous sources, their credibility is utterly demolished and utterly destroyed. And that's why right now in this country, we see that respect for the media has declined to record lows. So what journalists should be doing, first of all, they should be more transparent with the public about who their sources are and how they're using them. And even if a source has to be anonymous, you should at least provide some context about where your anonymous source is coming from and why, you know, show some skepticism. Let, let, a, let a reader understand, okay, if someone in the bureaucracy is leaking something, they might have an ulterior motive beyond simply being public spirited. Let, let the uh, readers judge for themselves whether they think uh, someone's motives for putting out information are honorable or not. So for in terms of context, as a uh, senior, le- senior level Trump administration <laughs> official, is that enough context? Probably not. No, not <laughs> at all. And, and of course, you know, the thing is, you can uh, describe people in such a generic way that it makes them sound like they're authoritative. And in yeah. fact, we often saw that label senior administration official applied to people who would never be considered senior administration officials if you actually knew what their title was and what they were doing. But also, um, you just don't get a sense of what kind of special agendas are being served by the leak. And the greatest example of all is, of course, Watergate itself. So Watergate, we're told, is, you know, two intrepid journalists, Woodward and Bernstein, who are uh, getting information from a you know, disinterested public servant who wants to expose the nefarious deeds of uh, Richard Nixon. Well, in fact, uh, Deep Throat, the most important uh, you know, anonymous source there, was Mark Felt. Why was Mark Felt giving this information to Woodward and Bernstein? Well, basically, he had been passed over by Nixon for being director of the Federal Bureau of Investigations. And the other thing people need to know here is that the original director of the FBI and the person that felt wanted to succeed was, of course, J. Edgar Hoover. J. Edgar Hoover ran, um, let's just say he was in a position to intimidate politicians, journalists, and anyone else he wanted. He had secret files on just about everybody. Mark Felt wanted that kind of power. It was a power play that he was involved in. And when Nixon passed him over, he was bitter and he decided to stab Nixon. But if um, uh, Felt had gotten what he wanted, he would have been using the same powers that J. Edgar Hoover was, was wielding in order to advance himself and his own agenda. So the whole, you know, there's an aspect of the whole Watergate saga, which you would think has been, you know, kind of litigated and exposed to the, to the utmost that most people still don't know about. And that is what Mark Felt's agenda was and why Woodward and Bernstein uh, collaborated with that rather than being more skeptical about uh, the nature of the source that was coming to them. Dan, you're speaking about Woodward and Bernstein. As a, as a you know, former journalist myself, I'm interested in hearing, are there any, you know, those no- names are absolutely legendary in the public imagination. I mean, there's been movies made out of this subject. Are there any journalists today that you would kind of name as taking on a similar legendary quality in the stories that they've reported, whether those stories have been, uh, you know, have some maybe less credible aspects or or so, but that are um, that have amassed public interest in that way. Um, and maybe on that note, adding, you know, perhaps do you have any favorites for journalists who have generally been very credible and deserve that type of, you know, that, that type of uh, attention? Yeah, you know, I like journalists who are very independent. So um, I was recently at the National Conservatism Conference. And as I was passing by the press table, I saw a few friends of mine were working at the table. Uh, so I came by and said hello. And then uh, Michael Tracy walks by. Michael Tracy is uh, pretty much a completely independent journalist at this point. He's someone who, you know, makes his living via Substack. Uh, You know, he's a reporter. He'll go out there. He'll, you know, interview people in the street in the middle of a riot and things like that. And, you know, he has his detractors. And, you know, there are times when he might get a fact wrong. But in general, he is a check upon the groupthink mentality that is so prevalent among uh, the professional media. So the fact that you still have independents like Michael Tracy who are willing to go out there and, uh, you know, call the shots as they fall. Michael Tracy gets, you know, he gets attacked by the left who say, oh, you are, you know, some sort of crypto Trump supporter or something. In fact, Michael Tracy's, a, a, you know, comes from the left philosophically, uh, as indeed do people like uh, Glenn Greenwald or Matt Taibbi. But they are still independent in their perspectives. And they show that, you know, I mean, Tracy does a lot of uh, individual reporting. Uh, people like Glenn Greenwald and Matt Taibbi are doing more analysis. 
but it's really uh, invaluable that they are independent. And I think that's where the best conservative journalism comes from as well. It's not that it is re representing the Republican point of view or you know some uh, ideological conservative point of view. It's rather that it is independent of the uh, you know sort of uh, the, the overwhelming flood tide of uh, conformist opinion that you tend to get from the mainstream media. I think uh, I, maybe this was a few months ago. I've kind of lost track of time, but there was a bit of a falling out between uh, the Intercept and Glenn Greenwald because it appeared that you know he was being perhaps fairer than a lot of the staff there would have liked on on some issues relating to the you know I think it was relating to the presidency or something. But it was interesting. It's interesting to see you know people like Michael Tracy and Glenn Greenwald amassing um, attention from. I know Tucker Carlson has had them on a few times, so gaining credibility for their reporting, which I I subscribe to their Substack. So I'm, I'm really interested in seeing their analysis of some of these things. But I'm really interested in also what your thoughts are on conser just the conservative media atmosphere. Uh, you know if we can kind of characterize something as the conservative media atmosphere. Obviously, we should strive for ob objectivity, but obviously Collegiate Network is obviously like trying to counter the biases of many on-campus newspapers, which as a function of being on campus can lean left. But conservative media too is accused of having its own biases from people from the left. So I, I, I want kind of ask how you make sense of of the conservative media atmosphere today. Yeah, in some ways, I think the word objectivity tends to uh, mislead people. And I would emphasize the need to be fair um, which doesn't mean, you know, 50-50 even-handed, but it does mean that even if you're coming from a certain point of view, you will let the other side have a hearing and let them, you know, say what they want to say and present some degree of their own interpretation of things. And again, that doesn't mean it has to be your interpretation or that you have to say that there is, you know, a kind of even spread in terms of credibility between competing uh, interpretations. But just give, a, give your reader the impression that there really is, uh, you know, more than one way of looking at the issue. The other thing I would emphasize is accuracy over objectivity. So again, you might be a journalist who's coming from a particular point of view, and that's fine. Uh, but you should be totally accurate in terms of uh, the facts that are in your story. And uh, you should, again, give people the tools, give your readers the tools that they need to verify the story for themselves to the extent that they can, and to see that there are you know, multiple ways of looking at the same facts. Uh, with you know, a lot of um, the mainstream media right now, they will check certain boxes and claim that they are being, you know, objective and, you know, maybe getting a quote from, you know, one source or another and then having, you know, a mix of different things. But really, you know, they're stitching together stories in such a way that it uh, heavily slants towards one direction and doesn't really give the impression that there could be any fair alternative reading of, you know, what they're what claims that they're making. I think conservative media, you know, often have done much better. And, um, you know, you can look at some of these uh, conservative journalists, people like Christopher Caldwell, for example. Um, you know, he is not a predictable, dogmatic, you know, conservative, orthodoxy kind of guy or a, you know, just a Republican shill or anything like that. Chris Caldwell is actually very interesting and is an original thinker. And similarly, if you look at, I mean, Tucker Carlson gets much demonized and he runs a daily, uh, you know, commentary program, which is always an enormous burden. And something that, you know, lends itself towards a certain kind of oversimplification. But Tucker Carlson's had a very long career in the media, including stints at, uh, you know, CNN and MSNBC. Uh, he's written not only for the Weekly Standard, but for a number of, uh, you know, more uh, centrist or left-leaning publications even. Um, he's someone who has um, represented, uh, you know, a, a kind of honest way of approaching media and news, even if people don't agree with them. And the fact that he has uh, these figures like Glenn Greenwald and uh, Michael Tracy on his program is a testimonial to that. And, you know, that's, this is not to say that I agree with everything that I hear from Tucker Carlson or with every programming decision that's made on his show. But it does seem to me that he is doing invaluable work in, well, basically furthering a conversation that can't simply be stereotyped as, you know, Republican versus Democrat, but rather is a conversation that tries to look at what's really important in this country. Dan, how do you, you know, if we look at the media as a Tocquevillian intermediate uh, institution, somewhere between government and the people, one, what do, you, what do you think the role of the media is, but also looking at it through a historical lens, has that role and function changed in different points throughout American history? Yeah, Tocqueville has a couple of great chapters on newspapers in democracy mm -hmm. in America. And he has a line, I'm not going to remember the exact quote, but he talks about how uh, every newspaper represents an association, you know, a kind of gathering of citizens. And uh, every gathering of citizens, an association, has a need for a newspaper or has a need for some sort of voice in the public and in the media. 
And Tocqueville is very concerned that um, in a democracy, uh, particularly in a democracy like that in America, where it's a young country with a lot of open space, people are spreading out. How do you start communities? How do you actually glue people together when, you know, self-interest and also the sheer scale of the country are both tending to pull people apart and scatter them? Uh, in the old world, you would have had certain kinds of political and religious uh, controls and forms of community. You would have had a local aristocracy, for example, that would be able to create a kind of a community consensus or community view simply because of their unique rank and their unique uh, you know, ownership of uh, large uh, tracts of property. But in the new world where people had small tracts of property, how are you going to create that kind of sense of community? Uh, because that's where you know, real um, self-government takes place is at the local level. And Tocqueville said this is the function that newspapers provide. Uh, they are something that allow you to spread your ideas among a variety of people. You might not be next door neighbors, but if you're both readers of the same newspaper, you are in a sense part of the same community. And the newspaper can have a role in coordinating your interests and your, your passions and, uh, and your knowledge. And that can be directed towards common projects and uh, you know, civic projects, for example. So Tocqueville you know, thought it was very important to have a competitive media, to have as many newspapers as possible. And what we've seen uh, you know, over the course of the 20th and now 21st century is that there have been several waves of consolidation, which have reduced uh, the variety that uh, Tocqueville thought was so essential to uh, the media in a democratic society. Um, things like, for example, the advent of radio and television, because they involved you know, an electromagnetic spectrum that only had so many wavelengths, uh, the federal government got involved in regulating and parceling out those wavelengths, which meant that there were relatively few slots for uh, radio and for television. And that's how you get these major networks of, uh, you know, in the 20th century, you only had a, a handful of networks, ABC, NBC, CBS, et cetera. Um, and then with the newspapers, you know, you've seen a number of forces that have contributed to a lot of consolidation in publishing of newspapers and also the extinction of a lot of local newspapers. And um, the counterforce to all of that was, of course, the advent of the Internet. And the Internet allowed everyone to start their own newspaper, basically their own blog. It allowed you to, uh, you know, start to discover things you've never seen before because, you know, the Internet was this wide open frontier. And yet what has happened over the course of uh, the last 15 years or so? The Internet has become a closed frontier and you've seen the Internet become uh, sort of pipelined into the social media networks, into Facebook and Twitter and a few other places. And those have then begun to uh, apply strict political, ideological and other controls on what can be said on their platforms. And that is a tremendous threat to free speech in this country, to freedom of thought and to democratic uh, you know, self-government and association. I think Tocqueville would be very, very critical of what the social media networks are doing right now. And in fact, he described in the early 19th century uh, the idea that if anything ever could consolidate the media the way that the social networks lately have, that power would be omnipotent, basically, within American democratic society, because it would have the ability to shape public opinion uh, to a degree that nothing else could. And that, in turn, would uh, allow for control of politics. And of course, we had a great illustration of that in 2020, where the social networks basically quashed a New York Post story that had some uh, you know, interesting and unflattering revelations about Hunter Biden, the son of Joe Biden. You know, Facebook and Twitter basically said, no, you can't, you can't show this story to people. You can't share it with them. Uh, and in fact, uh, the New York Post even had its Twitter account taken down for a while. Well, the story turned out to be true, uh, unlike a lot of the stories about Russian collusion that we'd heard during the Trump years uh, directed against Trump. And uh, I think there was a real material effect on the 2020 election from uh, that one story, just as I think there was an effect uh, on the many stories about, you know, sort of fake Russian collusion that had been promoted by uh, so many highly credentialed, highly influential mainstream journalists and center left journalists over the course of the, uh, the Trump administration years. Uh, Dan, you mentioned the Afghanistan papers in, in 2019 published by The Washington Post. Are there any other stories that you think were transformative for our society or political atmosphere that have been published in recent times? Yeah, you know, I mean, one of the big controversies, of course, is uh, WikiLeaks and, uh, you know, the troves of documents that have come out either through WikiLeaks or through a variety of other file sharing operations. Uh, some of the uh, leaks that we've seen have involved international banking. Uh, others have involved uh, foreign policy. And uh, one has to, and the, the thing is, I'm actually somewhat pleased by the fact that people do look a little bit skeptically, especially at some of the uh, foreign policy material that is uh, put out there by Julian Assange and, and WikiLeaks and so forth, because they understand, wait a minute, if some of this information is being promoted because, you know, there's a foreign government 
that might want to see America's secrets revealed while their own secrets remain hidden, that that is, um, it's not that the facts about American foreign policy that are being revealed are not correct and are not important to the public, but it's misleading if you're only getting that sense of things and if you're not also uh, seeing the extent to which other governments, whether it's China or Russia or whomever, uh, might be involved in information management. So I think people are right to be skeptical of you know uh, the interests of WikiLeaks or Julian Assange or whatever. And yet at the same time, this kind of ability to make available to the public actual documents from uh, especially governments and their uh, you know sort of foreign policy activities, I think that's very valuable, and that's that's an important uh, development in journalism in the 21st century. Um, I think people should be similarly skeptical when they look at some of these revelations about uh, international banking and, you know, the various accounts that uh, rich people might have their money hidden in, whether it's, you know, offshore, whether it's in South Dakota or wherever, Uh, because it is curious. I mean, where do some of these institutions get that information? Whose agenda is being served by leaking that information? Just as we saw during, again, the 2020 election, there were uh, certain tax, uh, you know, documents and pieces of tax information about Donald Trump that Trump had not released that were then being promoted by, uh, you know, the, by leaks and by, uh, you know, the, the mainstream media. And um, you have to ask yourself, like, who, you know, is this being done out of selfless public interest? And you could make a case, maybe, but you could also make a case, no, this is partisan interest. And whoever's doing this, you know, whoever has criminally broken into the IRS records and is, you know, putting this material out there, uh, that is a kind of, you uh, um, a one-sidedness or a distortion that is meant to be manipulating the public and getting the results that the leakers want to get. Dan, sort of bringing this home for our students, we recently hosted the Collegiate Network Editors Conference. I know you talked about some of this yourself. Andrew Sullivan was there. We had some other big speakers. Could you maybe share a little bit about some of the ideas that were discussed there and uh, the ways in which ISI and the Collegiate Network are really trying to bring these home in a practical basis for our student editors? Yeah, Andrew Sullivan uh, gave a great talk, and he reminded the audience that when he got started in journalism back in the 1980s, it was still a working man's profession. And, uh, you know, Sullivan has a background going back to Fleet Street, where you had, uh, you know, this was the mid-1980s UK, so you still had a very powerful labor movement. Uh, You know, it controlled the printing presses often. They would go on strike and you couldn't get a newspaper because the newspapers couldn't be printed because the uh, the printers union was on strike. Um, So, I mean, some of that, of course, had severe downsides. On the other hand, there was this sense that journalism was an every man's profession. And you did have even when you had college educated people and, you know, quite wealthy people go into journalism. It was understood that they were taking a step down by doing so. They were entering a profession where, you know, there's a lot of rough and tumble and people are not uh, treated with uh, kid gloves. Whereas in journalism today, there is instead this, um, I mean, you often meet uh, journalists uh, from prestigious uh, publications and they all have very similar personalities, very similar educational backgrounds, and of course, very similar outlooks and prejudices, especially when it comes to politics and economics and social issues and so forth. So that uh, uh, Sullivan was reminding us of a time when, when there really was more diversity of background and of intellectual interest among the media than there is today. Uh, other speakers at the Collegiate Network Conference uh, a couple of weeks ago gave uh, practical advice on good design for uh, publications or on uh, things like uh, going out there and, and reporting and uh, also like team management. I mean, if you're an editor, you have to be very good not only at uh, putting uh, getting the best work out of your staff, but you also have to be prepared to deal with a lot of freelance writers who, you know, some of whom have very um, fractious personalities. And so a good editor is someone who knows how to be a good manager and how to deal with people who have um, not just various different opinions and different interests, but very different personalities and what we might uh, delicately call personality quirks. Kind of circling back to campus journalism and student journalism, what do you think there was, I think this like horrific um, tweet going around about how much um, getting like a master's in journalism costs today from elite schools. And I think Columbia journalism, Columbia's journalism program came out at like $70,000 for a, uh, for a year of tuition. Um, And obviously somewhere like the, and this is just generally speaking, doesn't even have to be journalism, but um, just in the literary arts, getting a master's in it is extremely expensive and going to these elite workshops is extremely expensive and like prohibitively priced for 
for um, people who perhaps want to study journalism closer. Um, but do you, do you think that those programs are um, necessary for pursuing journalism today? Um, I mean, maybe perhaps the skills aren't um, aren't quite pertinent. Maybe it's just better to uh, approach journalism like a trade, like any trade w- requires practice and immersion. Um, or do you think there is um, value in pursuing journalism uh, further, like in a master's format? No, I think you're right. That journalism is a trade, and like a good trade, apprenticeship should be the key element. So you should become a journalist as early as possible, and you should start working with people who have been in the field for a long time and who can, you know, transfer institutional knowledge to you. And uh, and you know, the practice itself, going out there and actually doing it, talking to sources, reporting on the ground, and uh, working in a newsroom, uh, you know, working among an editorial staff, those are the things that make you a good journalist. And they're historically the things that have made all of America's greatest journalists. Think of reporters during World War II, or for that matter, you know, back into the 19th century. Now, the media has always had, you know, its share of problems, its share of distortions and corruptions. You know, the, the role of, you know, advertising and the role of ownership within the media always creates certain kinds of conflicts. But in terms of journalists themselves, there's no substitute for actually doing it and studying it. And trying to, you know, uh, achieve a kind of mind meld with other people in the profession or on the margins of the profession as kind of academics who theorize about the profession, that's actually very dangerous. And that, I think, leads to a kind of conformity and uh, it leads not to, you know, sort of best practices, but rather instead it leads to, again, uh, groupthink, which um, leads to the media being unrepresentative um, not only of the public, but also unrepresentative to the republic. It gives the the public a distorted sense of, you know, the issues that are out there, the complexity of the issues, and the way in which there's more than one way of looking at things. Um, I think journalism schools have been a tremendous bane on the journalism industry. And as you said, one of the effects they have is that they create, um, you know, this kind of credentialed elite. Uh, The people who have money to go to journalism school are typically going to be people who are more well off. They are It starts to create a class mentality and a class identity, which is antithetical to the idea of a true popular press. Well, Dan, thank you for all of these thoughtful remarks. I'm going to pivot to a uh, kind of broad and often, you know, complex and demanding question that we ask all of our guests. But I, I'm interested in um, your response, especially since um, on a recent panel we had, I believe it was Michael Knowles who, who called himself a McCarthyite uh, because he really appreciated um, kind of your approach to what conservatism is. But if you could tell our podcast listeners, and this is the question we ask all of our guests on here, is what is conservatism? Well, you know, I am a uh, Burkean conservative, uh, and I think that conservatism has to be reality based. There is a tendency, um, you know, among some people to make conservative and conservatism uh, a kind of adjunct to some uh, sweeping uh, approach to all of life. So you see this among people for whom uh, conservatism is really just a an outgrowth of economics. And uh, they may have, you know, a sort of perfectly libertarian or neoliberal kind of economics. And for them, conservatism winds up being just a, a kind of political, you know, uh, deformed appendage of this economic outlook that they have. Other people, uh, you know, tend to make uh, politics a kind of expression of metaphysics. And while metaphysics, you know, has, uh, you know, a proper role touching upon many things in all aspects of life, um, it is rather different to have, you know, a commanding understanding of Aristotle or of St. Thomas Aquinas and to be effective as a politician. As a politician, uh, or as a statesman, here I mean politician not in the sense of an elected official, but in the sense of someone who's engaged with other human beings, other citizens within a common civic project, uh, you know, with, which should have a civic common good. When you are engaged in that, when you are a, a politician in that sense, an engaged active citizen, you need to be able to have a give and take with uh, the other people around you. Uh, you're never going to have a, a polity that consists entirely of people who agree with you on everything. And um, if you think that that's what you need in order to be happy, then you're always going to be unhappy in politics. The nice thing about conservatism is that it is reality based. And, uh, you know, if you look at someone like Edmund Burke, for example, um, you know, he understood that there were limitations on what he could achieve as a statesman in his own lifetime. He was willing to be both pragmatic and compromising, but also to be very uncompromising when it came to the radicalism of the French Revolution, which he recognized as something that would be utterly destructive, not only of France, but of the entire European order of civilization and the entire inheritance of Christendom. 
So Edmund Burke, I think, is a, is a great role model for politics. Not to say he's perfect. You know, with anyone, you can always uh, make both theoretical and practical criticisms. But uh, politics does involve, and conservatism in particular involves, uh, an understanding of what is good about the society in which you live and a, a sense that you have to protect it. Um, even if that means in protecting it, you have to be very critical as well and that you may have to, uh, you know, look at uh, pathologies or, you know, infected, uh, you know, uh, parts of the, the civic body and uh, treat them with very harsh medicine. And again, I would cite uh, Burke's, uh, you know, approach towards the French Revolution and towards French revolutionary sentiment in Britain as being a case in point there. Well, Dan, thank you so much for joining us today. If people are interested in seeing more of your work or following you, where can they find you besides within the pages of Modern Age? Yeah, on Twitter, my uh, handle is at Tory Anarchist. So uh, something, uh, you know, kind of <laughs> spicy and surprising there for folks. Uh, Tory Anarchist is my handle on Twitter. And, uh, you know, I'm also on Facebook. Uh, I write a regular column for The Spectator, particularly their, uh, their U.S. Uh, print edition. Uh, I also write a great deal for uh, the website of the, the Spectator called Spectator World. And uh, my freelance work appears in many publications, uh, the Claremont Review of Books, First Things, New Criterion, uh, the New York Times, USA Today. I really uh, get around quite a bit. <laughs> well, thank you so much again for joining us, Dan. Thanks, Marlo. Thank you for listening to Conservative Conversations with ISI. If you've enjoyed this podcast, please feel free to head over to isi.org slash resources to see all that we offer our members, including the Intercollegiate Review, Select Modern Age Articles, ISI Books, and of course, this podcast. Thanks again for listening. Don't forget to rate and review, and we will see you next time on Conservative Conversations with ISI.